All right, good morning, everybody. Kæru gestir, velkomin, bæði þið sem fylgist með rafrætt og þeir sem eru með okkur í dag. I'm going to switch to English. We'll be using English all day for the most part. So, uh, dear guests, I just want to welcome you all to this annual spring presentation event. Uh, today, we're going to hear from some of our U.S. grantees uh, who will talk about their experiences in Iceland over the past months. Uh, we're really happy to be able to do this once again in person. Um, but, you know, we've all sort of gotten used to virtual in the past couple of years, so we're also offering that option, right? Uh, so uh, for those of you who are not able to join us in person, we're both on Zoom and on Facebook Live. Um, I would also like to note that the event is being recorded. So I want to give a really warm welcome to our U.S. grantees who are presenting today. Uh, as you may know, we had an excellent uh, event up north in Akureyri last week at the university, where we had three of our uh, scholars presenting, and they did a really great job. And I know it's going to be just as interesting today. It always is. This is this is such a great event. Um, through Fulbright Iceland, we offer our outstanding grantees an opportunity to grow professionally and as, a, as uh, individuals while contributing to their host institution. Being a Fulbrighter is a privilege and grantees take that responsibility that comes with it seriously. The grant period is a learning experience, but also an opportunity for them to share their knowledge and to engage locally, to share the best that the US has to offer and to immerse themselves in the culture of Iceland. They are ambassadors, ambassadors who work to increase mutual understanding between the US and Iceland. Uh, they build bridges, as well as collaborations and lasting friendships. And today we will learn about the experiences um, as their grant period for most at least is coming to an end. We have nine presentations today. We have with us six student fellows uh, and three scholars a really impressive group of people. Um, they come from a wide variety of fields. They're all engaged in interesting and impactful projects. And uh, I just want to note that it will be possible to ask questions after each presentation. Um, those of you who are not with us, and if you wish to pose a question, uh, you can do that, for example, through Zoom or through, through Facebook as well in the chat. Um, as I say, this is really a favorite event of mine every year. It's always such a pleasure to hear about the diverse projects, experiences, and perspectives of our US grantees. So without further ado, I'm gonna get started. Uh, we're gonna start the day off with some of our Fulbright fellows who are either in a university study program or engaged in their own research projects. Um, it's sometimes hard to go first, but I'm sure that Adam is up for the challenge. <laughs> uh, Adam is here studying Icelandic as a second language at the University of Iceland, and uh, he is the recipient of the joint Fulbright Ministry of Education grant in Icelandic studies. Uh, but I know that Adam has done so much more with his time here uh, and made lots of connections. So let's hear about his Iceland experience. Adam, uh, the floor is yours. All right. Yo, tak fyrir. Gaman að sjá ykkur. My name is Adam Taylor and I am the uh, Fulbright MOE grant recipient studying Icelandic as a second language at the University of Iceland. Um, so first, I would like to uh, talk a little bit about my background because it's been quite a circuitous path coming to this point. Uh, and I would really like to start oops, uh, on this slide, which shows uh, from 2012, my goals uh, that I decided to write down, and you can see 
there's a really strong theme going on here. Um, in 2012, I actually applied for a Fulbright. I was unsuccessful. Uh, so that's why I kind of crossed it out there. <laughs> but uh, I was thinking about all sorts of things. I'm a designer. Uh, I've been a designer for the past 10 years. Um, but language learning has always kind of been like a secondary interest area for me. Um, I've lived and studied actually in Iceland before and also in Denmark. And so in both places, I had the opportunity to take kind of intro to the language uh, courses. And so it's always sort of been my goal to really investigate that deeper and, and figure out what it is about languages that I that finds uh, that I find so interesting. So I'm going to talk a little bit about just briefly about my design background, uh, some personal design projects. This is actually my design MFA thesis. I am really interested in um, design for government, especially in the United States, and, and in particular voting. So this was an installation I created about the design of voting in the US. And um, you know, as I was putting this presentation together, I was thinking about how there is a lot of um, connection between the design world and, and language and communication and uh, participation. And so the participation is definitely something that I think about in my design work. Um, this is another example, which is a project called Manifesto for Voting Reform. It's a series of flags I designed with messages on them, thinking about uh, kind of reimagining how voting works. So <clears throat> I'm going to talk about language study now. That's why I'm here. Um, these are some of the languages that I've studied uh, sort of uh, in, in school settings. So Spanish in high school, German in college. I lived for a year in Denmark and most recently Icelandic. Um, and so, you know, I mentioned language has always sort of, it's been this like secondary interest area for me for so long. Um, so my goals pre Fulbright were to become fluent in a second language, Icelandic, of course, uh, to live for a full year in Iceland and experience all of the seasons, to, um, to expand beyond my life as a designer um, was kind of a, a big one. I was feeling very much like that was the only path that I could go down and I wanted to see what other paths could exist. Um, to reconnect with friends and colleagues in Iceland and definitely to make new connections with uh, my fellow Fulbrighters and other students at the University of Iceland. And I'm noticing I, I switch back and forth between using Icelandic and English, uh, you know, <laughs> how e is University of Iceland, how school is Iceland. Um, so start off with some fall semester highlights. Uh, I was really lucky enough to have my parents visiting at the beginning of the semester, and they actually walked me to school on my first day. <laughs> so here we are on our way to the university. Um, you know, we couldn't have a Thanksgiving as a Fulbright group because COVID was still really, you know, impacting us. But um, I managed with my small community of friends and family here to have a, a Thanksgiving meal and it was fully vegan, which was something new for me. Um, I really enjoyed our Fulbright activity of, you know, learning about wintertime treats in Iceland and, and you know, with this live, but if you can kind of see maybe my designer brain coming through <laughs> a little bit, kind of <laughs> very precise, but maybe um we saw the northern lights directly from our balcony uh, which was so incredible um got the chance to go this is sort of design related but to the uh museum uh, of design and applied arts to see this exhibition of uh, work over the life of uh, christine Torkelstotter, who has designed many important logos and uh, packaging and book covers and 
So if you go and buy a block of smear of butter from the store, that's her logo. Um, <clears throat> and also mjolk, the, the milk that's at the grocery store now with the beautiful flower packaging, also designed by her. Um, but at school, you know, at, at the University of Iceland, I took three classes. I took Taltjalvun, Islands Mal, and Malfredi, which are uh, speaking practice, Icelandic language, and uh, grammar. Uh, read the book there on the left, Ransoknin Aulendar Domem Elihu Sins, and read some, which is like a teenage novel type thing. Uh, and then some short stories from the book on the right. Uh, and some of my initial kind of reactions to studying at the University of Iceland are noticing just this intensity of the program. I wrote here, about half of the students in my grammar class actually failed or dropped out by the end of the first semester. Uh, so it was quite interesting to see how the, how the course just uh, shrunk over time. Uh, and also learning about the grading system here, uh, one through 10, something I wasn't used to. Uh, you know, in the US, we do this A, this letter grading system, and, and it doesn't really quite correspond to 10 equals A, 9 equals B, uh, 8 equals C. It's like much, there's some decimals in there and much more complicated. So yeah, quite interesting to learn about those things. Um, okay, some winter break highlights. Uh, which brings me to one of my favorite slides that I made. Uh, this, remember when we had our red weather warnings and um, uh, one of my favorite pastimes was to photograph the scooters getting stuck in snow. I thought that was quite funny. I mean, I, it seems ridiculous to ride them here. So I don't even try even in the summertime. Um, we had a really lovely winter uh, Christmas time. This is my partner Anton and and his brother's cat, who really did not consent to being in this picture. Uh, but we had a lovely winter. We zoomed with my family for Christmas. That was quite nice. Um, I got these two books over winter that I read. One is Polyphonia of Erlendum Uprena. Really important a new book that is published with poetry by uh, uh, immigrants to Iceland who've written, who are at various stages of learning Icelandic. So um, really powerful book. And then Aurstidir, which is a book of short stories that are written specifically at the B1, B2 level. So for people kind of at my level learning. Um, okay. Now we're ganging up for spring semester. Uh, I learned finally how to use bean, which is Bangarlising uh, Eastlands Knutimamals. It's basically a website where I can go to figure out if I've picked the correct form, gender, case, everything of a word. Here is Godur, which is good. Uh, and if I scrolled, it would go on and on and on. There's many sections here. <laughs> Um, uh, we learned about Icelandic poetry and the rhyming schemes. Uh, I discovered my favorite uh, ramen place downtown, High Noodle. Uh, really great vegan options there. I'm not vegan, but I like vegan food. Um, learned uh, about the cafe at Kjarvastadir, which is one of my favorite places to go. And um, relax and read and and um and a very good friend of mine from the u.s came to visit for her very first time leaving the united states she flew here and i got to take her on a trip so this is my friend carla you know we're at some waterfalls and we went to um, solheima yukut um and had a really special week visit together Thank you, Pieter, for this picture. Um, I'll think you visit was one of my favorites, uh, getting to meet uh, Piet Levy from the Pirate Party, and uh, and especially you know with my interest in 
kind of how government works. And this was a really fantastic activity. <clears throat> so my plants are really thriving now that the sun's here. Um, been studying a lot recently uh, at the library. And this is my friend Shante, who um, is also in Icelandic as a second language with me. She's also from the US. Uh, and she actually is a goalkeeper for Stjartman. Wow. And, and she is a captain for the Guayana, Guyana women's national team. So she's flying between here and the Caribbean pretty frequently. And she's somehow managing to do this program as well, which is really impressive. But yeah, we, we studied together uh, quite a bit. We're in the middle of studying. We have a final tomorrow, our last final. So uh, yeah. Spring semester overall at the university, I took uh, the continuation of my three classes. So Talfjallfun, Islands Malfrede. And I've written here, I'm finally understanding how cases work. It's something that's been really difficult for me to grasp coming from, you know, uh, English being kind of like monolingual growing up only in English. So case system has been my biggest challenge. Um, and learned a lot about how to study more effectively, uh, especially from my friend Shante that I just showed you and, and other people I've met at the university. Uh, and I thought I'd share some of my favorite words, which are vielmenni for robot, liosmodir, uh, midwife, and bergmauf for echo. Um, and I just find the compound word creation system in Icelandic so beautiful. For example, berg mal is like kind of mountain speech, mountain talk. And like you yell into a mountain and then you hear the echo coming back. Quite beautiful to me. Um, okay, some just some quick pictures of friends and family in Iceland. My partner Anton and his lovely family uh, and their cats. <laughs> And I, we, every time we see them, it's like fully in Icelandic. They don't ever speak English to me, which is really great, really great way to practice. And, uh, and they're very lovely people. And then reconnecting with old friends, people that I met, I lived here in 2013, I mentioned. Uh, and so these are some people, designers and artists uh, who, who are friends of mine that I was able to reconnect with this year. <laughs> And new friends, of course, too, uh, from Fulbright uh, and people I met at the university, although these are Fulbright people. Um, we had some really great times this year. So what's next? Uh, my goals post Fulbright are to complete the BA in Icelandic as a second language. Uh, and I'll just pause to say uh, thank you to the Ministry of uh, Education and Culture slash Arnestopnen for selecting me to have a continuation grant for the coming year. I'm very excited about that. Thank you. <laughs> uh, hopefully to pursue the MA in exhibition making, uh, mediation and curatorship at the university, uh, which is taught in Icelandic, um, to work within the cultural sector, uh, here and to position myself to apply for a PhD in the future. So in the meantime, I'm just watching the uh, new uh, building for Icelandic studies being constructed on campus and, and just waiting for the day that I get to go inside and see what it looks like and, and maybe take a class in there. And uh, yeah, just wanted to say thank you very much to the Fulbright US student program, to Fulbright Iceland, Belinda Pieter Petra, Icelandic Ministry of Education and Culture, Alvin Magnusson Institute with Branislav Pieti, um, all my Icelandic teachers, Seke Katrin Kauri Thora, and Max Naylor from the UK, friends and acquaintances, and uh, of course my partner Anton, who speaks Icelandic to me as much as I can handle. And yeah, thank you very much. <clears throat> so now um, we do have time if there are a couple of questions. 
anybody have any questions in the audience? Bob? Uh, last year, you may remember there were a couple of incidents um, which I thought was really interesting. One was uh, Katarina used, I'm not sure if it was a slang or a Pronounce a slang pronunciation or a slang word, mm. and she was heavily criticized by Icelanders for using that. And then I don't know if it was related, but the president came out and said, Look, you know, we're going to have to get used to people making grammatical mistakes, mm. pronunciation mistakes. Do you, in your experience um, as a foreigner speaking Icelandic, do you see that there's a real need for a culture shift mm. um, in uh, Iceland to allow for, you know, mistakes and, mm. and, uh, learning the language mm -hmm. uh, as a because that's the number one thing that the UTL has for integrating refugees and, and immigrants is to learn the language. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to get hammered every time you do, yeah, that's tough. I, it's a really important conversation. Uh, I, I've seen sort of both sides of it, I guess I, um, I mean, on one hand, like, my partner and I and other people around us are talking about how he's he's told me if if you just spoke in uh, the nominative case and you didn't change case at all, I could still understand what you were saying, you know, and and so that's yeah, that's something. But I, I also think like. Um, I mean, this program that I'm in, it's very rigid, very structured, which on one hand is good because it's, you know, getting us prepared to understand all of those that, you know, they showed that screen capture of that website where every single mm -hmm. conjugation exists. But on the other hand, like half of the people in my program have, have quit or are leaving. So it's, mm -hmm. it's really rigid. And I, I do think there's opportunity to kind of welcome in I mean, or at least to be able to listen to and sort of like engage with people who are learning. And that's why I showed those books, which I think are really important. Um, uh, Polyphonia of Erlende Miprana, which is like, you know, immigrants here who are writing in Icelandic. And yeah, it was a really beautiful book. I recommend for all Icelanders. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Um, did we have, we don't have anything online. I'll have to remember to check that. It's I can so see the chat. One, oh, yeah. one person okay. wrote in the chat, or I can't see it, but I see yeah. there's one. That, was, that was me uh, asking the Zoom participants to write questions in the chat. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. Well, we are actually about out of time. So okay. thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so now we're going to go to a completely different subject. Next, we're going to hear from Tyler, um, who applied to Fulbright Iceland through Northeastern University. And he's studying for a master's degree in environmental engineering at the University of Iceland. And I know he has appreciated working with his advisor, uh, department chair and member of the Fulbright board, uh, who's actually with us here today. Thank you. Oh, and I did want to mention that we will have board members here throughout the day, uh, sort of coming and going, but there will always be some board members here. We have Hrunt and we have Palk here with us today. You'll hopefully get a chance to, to chat with them later. Um, so anyway, um, let's hear from Tyler and what he has to say about Iceland and, and his studies and life here. Yeah, we've got the slide. Um, there we go. Well, good morning. My name is Tyler Kogel, and I am a student fellow. Um, as you know, uh, as it was just stated, I have a background in mechanical engineering. I got my bachelor's from Northeastern University in Boston, and I have been seeking to combine my mechanical engineering experience and my civil and my environmental engineering degree to uh, as part of a, a measure to create a more global approach to solving environmental problems and challenges. Since coming to Iceland, my goals have been to grow in my understanding of environmental engineering and sustainable living, learning from the lived experience in Iceland, uh, to learn about the culture and people of Iceland, and to form relationships and work collaboratively, especially because we need to work collaboratively to solve these global problems.
before I start, I would like to say thank you to all who have helped me along this journey. A special thanks to the Fulbright Commission, the Iceland staff, the University of Iceland, and my advisor, Dr. Harund Olof Andradotir. Oh, I also wanted to say that uh, my grant is for the study, master's level study of environmental engineering at the University of Iceland. And I also decided to include a lot of pictures. I just found Iceland so inspiring. I just couldn't help myself but fill this presentation with pictures from all over uh, my times. Um, so my grant is for the mass, uh, sorry, let me move on to the next place. When I first arrived in Iceland, I can remember how I was just glued to the window, just looking out into the fog, wondering when I would see land. And then when the land party was just, it was just like I remember the beautiful um, wide open expanses. It reminded me a lot of my last time here when I was in 2013 as a teenager. And it's really, uh, Iceland's natural beauty has been an inspiration for me for as long as I can remember. The wide open expanses really helped center the mind and bring peace. As I stood near the volcano, uh, I did a, a trip to a volcano with my parents. And as I stood near the volcano, it really helped to provide context. And I think Iceland's a really great metaphor for climate change in that you have these geological forces which are shaping the environment, just as our climatic forces, uh, our efforts to uh, emissions and uh, the Anthropocene and the like, were shaping the environment just as a natural force, just like a volcano in a way. Um, and it just sort of really helps connect it all together. And I also think that uh, as, when it comes to Iceland, that another inspiring thing was how the natural beauty is not just contained to the outer expanses, but it's within the cities as well. And I just couldn't help myself, but took a bunch of pictures of the flowers I just encountered. And I think flowers, these flowers right here can be a really great representation of the biodiversity that we can host within cities. Just as we can have thousands of flower species uh, or hundreds of flower species, we can have hundreds of different organisms that might rely on them, including insects and pollinators, as well as other animals like birds and the like. It really just sort of depends. But the, the point is there. Um, and I especially loved all the hidden parks and courtyards, just walking around and finding these hidden spots just made it all the more rewarding. And I especially thought it was impressive how much color you could really fit into a single flower pot. It just sort of speaks to the power of diversity in plants and how it connects into the urban environment. And just sort of like as there can be colors with flowers, I mean, even after the flowers are covered with snow, you can continue to find color, whether it be in the city lights, the northern lights, um, holiday lights, and so much light and color there. And then there's especially another favorite of mine is the Reykjavik street art. And right here, you can just sort of see that it's, a, it's a, like, a, I would see it more as an extension of the creative community in Iceland. And it really just sort of adds character to all these different unassuming places and uh, makes each walk really rewarding. Combined with the walkability of Reykjavik, it just, it, it made me a very avid walker. <laughs> Now, student life really works up an appetite. And I was, oh, sorry about that. Student life really works up an appetite. And I was really glad that uh, there was a lot of great food, especially some of my first meals I had here were the soups and I kept on coming back. This one was from the Hama at the uh, Museum of Iceland. And there were many other Hamas on campus. And I really appreciated like the, the simple pleasures of, the, of like, the soup, for example. It really helped keep me going. But um, outside of campus, I really found it really interesting how Reykjavik is a place where you can find traditional food, uh, meeting international food. Um, and, and there's so many local owners and that's like a very big distinction, I would say, as, as opposed to a lot of chains you might see in the US, you can find countless owners, each with their own perspective that they're trying to tell through food. And I just find it really, it's just so much fun just to go in into the city and find all these different visions and experience them, whether it be uh, fish stew at Icelandic bar, uh, a brunch at Café Floran, 
or my favorite, like the uh, one of my favorite spots was to get a vegetarian noodle soup at uh, Noodle Station. That was just by the climber right here. Um, and I think, well, given all that food, of course, the, the focal point of my time here has been my studies. Now, I, I had to include this picture because I loved how Haskolia Island really loved to inject character into their login screen and they changed the owl like constantly. It's, <laughs> it really, it really makes light. It just, it just sort of brightens up my day. It never fails. Uh, and uh, I would have to say that the Icelandic experience uh, for my time in studies here, just to sort of think about it more in, in general, um, can be best summed up with kindness, I would say, whether it be the broad and meaningful support provided by the faculty uh, and student and uh, support staff at the university, or the free food provided cereal before exams. I, I really appreciated it when they had like a stand offering cereal before exams. And there were teachers, the teachers really made themselves accessible and really tried to partner with their students. I felt like I was able to really learn a lot more off hours as just as just as much as I could learn during in hours, like, and I really appreciated that. And then, of course, there's the international perspective. I think having such an international body with international topics and even international lecturers, I felt like we were doing a really good job of thinking of both not only learning about Iceland, but also about interesting approaches across Europe and abroad. And I also appreciated the experiential learning provided, whether it be the field experiments trips or the practical experience provided by different visiting faculty that, were, that had uh, experience in the field. As far as the courses I took, a cornerstone of my student life was of course my courses, uh, whether it be sustainable cities, a class where we sort of wrangle with the idea of what it means to be sustainable through creating a policy for a sustainable city. And we were able to really take and apply innovative research and sort of have a, a collaborative discourse with our professors, which was a really interesting and intriguing way of learning is through this discourse and argumentation. Um, and then there was the wastewater collection and urban drainage as well as water quality. These courses really helped to uh, familiarize um, one with the water, with the, with the challenges and problems facing water quality today, as well as uh, water, uh, wastewater and stormwater systems and methods to address it. I really felt like I got a, a great perspective from that, from those classes. And geochemical analysis was a course that really helped to uh, provide context for how scientists can go and take and uh, measure the natural environment, whether it be through rock samples or through water samples, to help create a picture for the climate as well as other, as well as draw other conclusions. Um, and then environmental microbiology was a really great course towards providing context for the microbiome at work within wastewater treatment plants as well as within the natural environment to help and understand how we can better work with the environment um, and harness it. Uh, and then membranes, I think was just a really great class um, to understand how membranes of which are very critical technology for wastewater purification work and really can be used to purify water uh, and wastewater. Pardon this. Okay. Oh, sorry. It overcompensated. Um, so, so, I guess it also to supplement my coursework, I had many experiential opportunities providing real world context to my studies. On the far left, you can see the Freimar greenhouses, where they really take advantage of the geothermal water, um, geothermal heating, as well as the water and uh, plentiful water supplies and uh, energy supplies. To grow green, to grow uh, hydroponic tomatoes year round, and uh, essentially this means they're growing without soil. And it was really cool to be able to go in there and actually have the tomatoes um, as a soup or as your meal. And uh, to the left, to the right of that, you can see a trip uh, I undertook to a rural wastewater treatment plant to gain firsthand experience of wastewater treatment in Iceland. And to the right of that, you can see ongoing research whereby wastewater is being used as fertilizer for hydroponics. I thought that was really fascinating. Um, and then to the right of that, you can see a lab practical 
where we were sampling waters from the Sutherhorn uh, off in between the Icelandic Iceland University campus and Reykjavik, where we were taking water samples and using titration to analyze the carbon content of the water. It was just really cool to get hands on with the chemistry and hope to get a sense for that. Now, sorry, let me look up. Yeah. Sorry about the delay. All right. Now, let's see. But what did I learn from my time here? Well, I've learned many things. I mean, for one thing, uh, there are from the from the wealth of unique opportunities and experience at the Graduate University of Iceland. I was really able to learn that sustainability is really not just about the environment. It's about, it also encompasses the social and economic aspects. And in order for us to really be sustainable, we need to consider those too. I also was able to broaden my understanding of green space. It's more than just aesthetic and it has a real, it can provide a real function, whether it be to mitigate climate change, com, uh, help to combat climate change, or manage stormwater and, uh, produce and promote biodiversity. Uh, there can be, and then I also got to familiarize myself with real world applications of environmental planning, whether it be the Reykjavik Regional Capital Plan, where I got to understand for spe uh, specific provisions that are being undertaken to really apply environmental policy into real world uh, plans. And then also getting to familiarize myself with challenges of wastewater treatment, whether it be emerging pollutants, um, such as like microplastics and the like, and also understand sustainable urban drainage, where you can really sort of use green infrastructure to help contain stormwater flows. It's, uh, and then really helping to expand out tools also to assess sustainability, such as life cycle assessment, and was able to apply them in, in my project to analyze bioplastics, and as in particular, way-based plastics that use glycerol and rosemary extract. And then it really just was also a really great time to pick up a new understanding of wastewater and that sort of looking at it, the, and the idea was introduced essentially, whereby instead of thinking of wastewater as sort of treating um, one waste stream, but instead breaking out into a variety of different waste streams that we can then customize for different product end uses. So, and a great example of that could be composting, for example whereby uh, composting sort of represents like taking something like food waste and turning it into fertilizer as, and by keeping and limiting the, like the different inputs because current municipal wastewater has a lot of different components added in, it can help to create a more advanced end product. Um, so more specialized towards fertilizer, for example. So if you want a fertilizer, you don't want to have a lot of toxic compounds in your fertilizer. So limiting what you put into that waste stream sort of separating them out and specializing them can make a big difference. I've also observed some differences in comparison to things, uh, the way things are in the US in terms of the environment. The, it's really fascinating to have been able to be here to understand just sort of how valuable renewable energy can be in terms of like what happens once you have widespread renewable energy. And I think it really shows that there's some advantages to industry, uh, whether it be sort of like you could allow for more aluminum smelting, which might not be like feasible in many other places becomes feasible within Iceland. And you can see modern conveniences such as like geothermal piping under streets to prevent ice formation as well as the public swim pools that can stay open. And that's definitely thankful to the, uh, thanks to the geothermal, but all that geothermal water is coming from geothermal energy. And so in a way they're very much connected. It sort of points to what can be done if you have um, easy access to energy, heat, and water. Um, it's on the flip side. Uh, it also means that there's less emphasis on energy and water efficiency here, but I still think it's a really great case example and sort of provides a good model for countries that are moving to uh, be more sustainable. I think it's also really interesting how different wastewater can be here compared to the states and that because of how uh, low density the, in the population can be, you can, see a, uh, you can see that there is a problem of uh, 
it's a lot harder for the wastewater to be treated and uh, sort of introduce its own problems in that. Uh, you might see the population is very, uh, what is it? Very dispersed. And so it, it, it creates challenges for wastewater treatment. But it also um, opens up opportunities for thinking of ways to treat uh, wastewater in rural applications and creates new applications for that. And there's also challenges with food, of course, due to the limited size of Iceland and the limited growing season and new technologies such as greenhouses and indoor farming can help challenge and address that. Uh, I'll address that challenge. And then I'm going to just speed through. So while well, I, well, a bit more challenging, I was still able to make some connections while I was here, whether it be the connections with faculty and academic and research communities at the University of Iceland, or whether it was some of the student organizations like Gaia Iceland, as well as other partner, as well as outside parties, such as Serta Hold Organic Farm, Fremar, and um, even got to make some, thanks to connections with uh, my advisor, I was able to familiarize myself with the Agriculture University and reached out and am also uh, getting perspective from them. And I look forward to the collaborations I'll be making with them over the years. And then when I come back to the States, I just wanted to make a point that although, although I may have introduced a lot of different things, all these things sort of connect together, whether it be through these parks, whether it be through the parks that I showed, like the representing biodiversity, the or the water treatment and the food production, it all really intersects in so many ways and it creates all these new opportunities. My goal from here is to utilize the knowledge and connections I've gained in this Fulbright experience to create lasting collaborative efforts to address global environmental challenges. And for that work, may the fourth be with us. <laughs> Can I ask you, Tyler, um, are you going to be staying on for your studies now or are you going back to the States? I'm planning to go back to the States to continue my environmental engineering studies. And, okay, and, and where are you going to be doing that? At uh, Stanford. Um, uh, wonderful. And so how do you sort of foresee continuing your um, connections here when you're back there? Well, I, there's a Green Days event with Gaia, for example, and I'm thinking of trying to have a collab when they have some events. When I go back, I'm going to be making some uh, connections and trying to arrange for a sort of a follow-up and maybe do like a call-in and just sort of provide a program at the, at the Green Days event next year. Right. And that's my goal. Because I just found so much fun just hearing from these international perspectives and they had many people that called in already and just sort of expanding that network would be really cool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Okay. Uh, we have a question from Zoom. Mm -hmm. So Mecken Orman asks, uh, I'm curious what, if any, were the most striking cultural, social, academic differences in the idea of sustainability between Iceland and the US? Very small question. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think that there were some concepts that I had not really been familiar with. I'm not really sure, but like, I think when we talk about sustainability, we often don't really, we're not very familiar in the States, I would say with uh, circular economics of the donut economy. I think that that's somewhat not, or and also aspects like concepts like degrowth. Um, and those were very much within the, the context of uh, common discourse within the environmental uh, uh, students I was talking with. But it was really interesting to gain insight on these concepts uh, and sort of really challenge assumptions we've held about green growth. I think that the US is a big proponent of green growth as opposed to degrowth or uh, circular economics as so, so much. I mean, definitely there are circular economic policies being pursued in the US, but like, I'm not sure if we think about it in terms of the, um, and sort of that broader sense of environmental engineering. Getting back to what I said earlier, I think that we often think of environmentalism as purely within the environmental realm, but we fail to think about how it, it works uh, socially and economically. And that's often what limits the implementation of our environmental policies. Uh, that was a great presentation. Um, you really made me think about something you've just repeated, which is thinking about environmental studies in relation to kind of other disciplines. Having been in higher ed for two decades, in my experience, environmental studies often gets kind of 
cocooned over in the sciences and the connections sometimes to the humanities can be a little bit impeded or worse, even when you have faculty teaching like environmental literature, things like that. So I was thinking about this um, when you were showing the street art. And I was thinking as some of that, because my daughter, my six-year-old is a huge fan of the street art mm -hmm. here. I now have to photograph all <laughs> of it for her before we leave. This will be challenging. Um, did that make you think a little bit about like street art and that kind of color you were talking about, other ways that you can implement some of those other elements of your Icelandic experience if you have design opportunities in the future? Hmm. I definitely think that street art is a great analogy for creativity and sort of bringing these different perspectives together. And it's also sort of a, a great analogy for sort of communication, because if you if you write a message, it's very accessible to everyone. And that's sort of like kind of what we want to make environmentalism. We want to make it accessible to everyone. So I think it's a really great idea to think about it in terms of like a goal to strive towards to make this environmentalism, take it away from the halls of academia and bring it to everyone. And sort of we could even potentially use street art as a way to communicate environmentalism, too. Okay, great. Thank you so much. We're off to such a great start with these first two, aren't we? Um, so um, next up is Jillian, a biologist who came to us from Bowdoin College in Maine. Uh, her independent research project revol revolves around seaweed aquaculture. And she's based in the West Fjords, which we were always happy to have our grantees, not all in Reykjavik, but based in different parts of the country. So very happy that, that Jillian has been doing her work in the West Fjords. She's hosted by the University Center there and also affiliated with a startup in this sort of very innovative field. So it's quite exciting. I'm really interested to hear about this sort of fascinating project and how it's been developing. So Jillian, I invite you to take the floor. Great. Good morning and thank you for the introduction. Um, so yeah, so when I first went to Iceland, I actually was on a um, pause between uh, the US and Scotland and I was delayed in security uh, and maybe that was a sign that I would be returning uh, in the future and never did I think that I would be working up in the West Yards um, on a seaweed farm or in a seaweed startup. So um, there are lots of similarities between my home in uh, coastal Maine and Iceland. A small community like Isafjordr has a lot of resemblance to my hometown, as you can see up here um, on the right. Um, there's a lot of similar difficulties spe specifically with regard to climate and adapting coastal infrastructures um, to a future in which ocean acidification um, and temperature rise are um, going to play a, a huge negative impact um, on fishing in particular. Um, so in Maine, we're struggling uh, with the lobster industry, obviously is, is in decline, um, primarily, primarily due to ocean acidification. Um, but uh, here in Iceland, um, obviously there's a huge fishing background, um, but uh, seaweed is a huge um, sort of asset to the fishing industry um, and to also uh, small coastal communities that are looking for um, new ways of benefiting from the um, from the ocean. So shellfish, shellfish and fish farming is currently the licensable um, way of um, of using marine resources here. Um, and currently, I'm working uh, up north with a, a startup that is looking to push the kelp license and seaweed licensing forward. Um, so again, part of my work was integrating both the science side of um, increasing seaweed in Iceland and seaweed farming in Iceland, but also combining that with this social perspective of preparing um, small coastal communities for a future in which climate will play a big role um, in their continued success and sustainability. Um, so this is a bit of a um, an introduction to seaweed farming. Um, people have a lot of different you know, ideas of how seaweed can be used um, and where it is currently. Uh, so in Maine, um, again, as, as I mentioned, um, it's seen as a huge future um, for, um, uh, for the lobster industry and also for oyster farming. Um, 
and it upholds a lot of the social and cultural traditions. So people can still use the, um, the ocean as a resource um, without worrying about the future where lobster are on decline or ground fish are on decline. Um, and here in Iceland, uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a really uh, key future um, for seaweed because it combines both, both the fishing industry um, and also shellfish. Um, so it can sustain both, again, the, the social and the scientific fabric. Um, it can be used as a nutrient waste cleanup for some of the, the downsides of fish farming. Um, and it also has a lot of um, uh, key components, which I'll mention later on, um, in terms of being used in renewable plastics, uh, in terms of carbon sequestration and um, preventing coastal erosion. Um, so my work um, was primarily with um, a startup company called Elde Aqua, which is a component of the um, of Jupid, which is basically um, a like a community center that um, uh, basically hosts a lot of different projects, such as Elde Aqua, which is the seaweed um, piece. So this is Volungervik here uh, with the Orange Lighthouse. Um, this is myself and my boss in Breidafjordur. Um, and uh, basically my role was as the hatchery manager. Um, so we were building from the ground up uh, a kelp hatchery uh, in Isafjordur. Um, and my, my work basically was um, looking at what other small scale hatcheries um, had done so far and where they'd started. Um, and uh, it's building that basically in Isafjordur. Um, and so the other, another part key component was establishing both global and local ties. So uh, working with community members in Isafjordur, students, um, other interested um, like fishermen and uh, algae and kelp farms around Iceland, of which there are few at this point. I also was in touch with um, farms that I'd worked with at home in Maine um, for some of my protocols and research and setting up the lab. Uh, and also in Scotland, um, there, there are some of the leaders in, in the kelp uh, world. Um, I also was working in the in terms of community engagement. There's the University of Westfjords there, um, so that that um, was actually really exciting for me because a lot of the students there are doing their master's theses, um, and so they would often just come to me and say, "Oh, I'm interested in maybe doing food security or something with kelp uh, or sustainable aquaculture in the future. Can we meet for a coffee and chat?" And so that was also a key part of just being engaged there as I was setting up the hatchery. Um, and then I'm also, um, you know, a member of this of this company now. So looking to the future of um, seaweed in Iceland, and planning out Alde Aqua's role in that, um, both in offshore tech and um, onshore hatchery um, design. And so one of the components of my work in Isafjord was um, conducting an experiment um, again from scratch. So here you can see a refrigerator that we. Uh, drilled holes in and used um, air stones from fish tanks um, and ordered these um, flasks and took kelp from the East Fjordor coastline. So this was basically our, our way of uh, starting a climate control chamber. Um, in, in an, uh, we were reusing um, the basement of the University of Westfjords up there um, and repurposing it for, um, for a lab space, but basically it, it's an old, uh, it's like a fish processing center. So there's still fish equipment, you know, around the room and uh, it's, it's, it's transitioning as, as Iceland and a lot of other small communities are towards sustainable aquaculture. So my key project was um, looking to manipulate the um, reproductive cycle of kelp. So typically it um, has this fertile tissue that releases seeds in the summer months. Um, and then a typical kelp farm, like this line here in the Faroe Islands, um, would, would be seeded in October, and then it would grow and be productive basically to harvest in April and May. Um, but so my goal uh, of working in the hatchery um, was to basically manipulate that fertilization process of kelp so that um, using environmental parameters of temperature and light, um, so basically so you can create seed at any time in the year. And that's key for a small startup uh, and for these small kelp companies sort of around Scotland and the Faroes, um, because if you can provide seed at any time of year, um, you can really get a lot of interested farmers involved and they can start the farms at any time as well. So it's, it's sort of a, a key hurdle that's being researched right now in a lot of literature um, for increasing kelp farming accessibility to, um, to farmers. 
So that was successful. You can see here the dark tissue is the, um, the fertile spore tissue. Um, so that worked, uh, even though it was in a, a small refrigerator. <laughs> um, and yeah, it's exciting to look to the future for, for how that might um, make us more of an asset to the community. Um, so the seaweed future in Iceland, um, again, as I mentioned before, kelp has a lot of pros. Um, the pharaohs are a big leader, as is Maine, Scotland, and Iceland, hopefully, in the future. Um, so these are some of the partners of Eldeaqua. Sway Plastics is a, um, basically creating plastics out of, out of kelp and seaweed. Um, Katla Textiles, um, they are going to be really exciting um, this summer. They um, are a, a designer and, um, and uh, I think he's at the, from the tech world in the US, but they have bought an island in Breda Fjorder um, in which we will now be setting up another hatchery similar in the model to the one I've set up in Issa Fjorder and also an offshore component, which will be a research farm at first this summer, and then it will become more of um, an offshore harvesting tech. Um, so that's Katla textiles. They use, they use um, kelp in um, like a cotton blend. Ocean Rainforest is one of our, um, our partners and uh, correspondents through this process. They're in the Faroe Islands and they're one of the, the global leaders in offshore harvest. Um, so just growing kelp on the line, as you saw before. Blue Evolution is a hatchery tech company in the US um, and they have several farms in Kodiak and Baja and we've been in touch with them as well um, in terms of hatchery technology and growing growing in a lab space. Um, and so again, key to this, this Iceland future is integrating coastal infrastructures that are that are key again, as Tyler was talking about to, um, to the social fabric, the social and cultural community of, of using a marine resource. Uh, but also moving forward to look at, okay, how are ways that we can engineer this so that it's more adaptable to, to climate. So we can use, we can use seaweed and fish farming uh, and shellfish as well together. Um, so here's a, a list of, or just a grouping of different photos from my time at UC Fjorder as it, as it expanded beyond Aldeaqua. This is us having a beach fire at the Belungervik beach. Uh, Belungervik is where one of the um, offices of Jupit is. Uh, this is the Fosvatten, which is a, um, a ski race that draws an international crowd um, that occurred a couple months ago. And that was, I skied in that, which was really wonderful and beautiful way of seeing the mountains and um, just meeting a lot of people from all over the world who come to, to Isafjordr. Um, these are two um, sailboats that uh, run a, um, a um, a tourist company out of the West Fjords. And I've worked on boats at home in Maine. So I was able to find work on them, uh, just helping them like get the boats ready for the season and um, just, yeah, just being involved in sort of the sustainable tourism. Uh, this is my boss. We were collecting some uh, mussels and seaweed from the shoreline. Um, this is me. Uh, we went out to Svepnar, which is the island Katla, the clothing company that we'll be using this summer and design the hatchery and offshore farm. This is me driving a snowmobile as well with a researcher who just arrived from Kiel. She will be setting up the same lab space and I'm helping her to design it for her project, which is centered around blue mussels um, and their response to light pollution. So she's working with the University of Westfields, but uh, my boss took us both for a snowmobile. <laughs> and this is the Fab Lab, which is a wonderful um, thing that I've not seen in, in the US, although there are Fab Labs all, all over, but there's one right in Easy Fjorder. You can come in and use the equipment um, for any project that you like. Um, and they were key in uh, building some of the refrigerator technology that we used. Um, I also um, spent some time in addition to working for Eldeaqua at the University of the Westfields. The student community is wonderful. Um, I am so thankful to all of them for just including me in, in all of their adventures and uh, courses. I took two four credit courses throughout the, the winter, um, one with my advisor, Catherine Chambers um, in maritime anthropology. Here's us here. We were, um, we, there was a diving, like an underwater diving component um, where one of the divers um, that works for the Belungervik dive, sort of like surveying uh, office and does a lot of work on shipwrecks. He came in and was teaching us how to triangulate underwater, like how they, how they basically uh, get a sense of what happened at the ship and they can look at different um, things underwater uh, that way. So we were practicing on shore, obviously. Um, 
And I also took a talking science course, which was all about um, science communication and um, again, the social and scientific aspect. Um, uh, I also um, will be working in future in sort of an advisory position with Peter Weiss and Catherine Chambers as they um, design and think about the future of the same um, lab space that I was using. So how it can be used in the future for aquaculture if students are interested. Um, again, like visiting uh, students from Kiel, like, um, like my friend Melanie, who I showed before. Um, and that's her project with the game project. The, the game project out of the university. Um, so that's my was my involvement at the University of Westfields, uh, which was really wonderful. And um, again, to a note to my future involvement, I'll be continuing uh, with Alde Aqua for the summer, um, just in an advisory role as I work at home on a mussel and kelp farm. So I won't be in person, but I'll be helping them set up the, the hatchery and the research farm on Svefnir in Bredefjorder. Uh, and working with a couple of students from the University of Westfields who will be who will be setting that up in person. Um, I'll also continue with my one of my advisors who's who's at the University of Iceland, um, Professor Angulo. He's a professor of oceanography, and um, he's eager to use this Svefnir uh, research research site that we're setting up um, to monitor nutrient and currents, um, and that would be key for designing the future offshore kelp farm there. So um, he will, he's on board with, with using this site uh, and, and it'll be exciting to continue working with him as well. Um, I've also, um, during my time this spring, I was invited or applied to um, the Association of Polar Early Career Scientists to present on kelp farming in Monaco. Um, and this is us in front of the casino. <laughs> so I will continue to be involved with them in their remote meetings. Um, and you know, as a as hopefully you know, there's there's openings on the board, um, but it's just an exciting group of of yeah of young scientists that was a really eye opening experience to be able to present there. Um, and then next year I'll be um, in getting a master's in marine ecosystems management in Scotland at the University of St Andrews. So starting in September I'll be working there, and um, I'm excited to get involved with the kelp farms that are on the west coast there, and and just continue. Um, yeah, continue in the aquaculture field and uh, and yeah, continue with Alde Aqua just in a remote position and coming back to Iceland as much as possible. <laughs> so uh, I'd just like to thank Alde Aqua and Jupid um, and my my um, advisors there, the entire University of Westford's faculty who were incredibly welcoming um, and Catherine Chambers, the University of Iceland and my advisor there, Angel, Angel and of course the, the entire Fulbright Commission for just all of your help and advice uh, through this wonderful and eye-opening uh, experience. So thank you. I mean, really fascinating. And I think also for us, um, you know, to be increasingly involved with this kind of innovative and sort of startup work is important for our commission. So we're really, really pleased uh, with this pairing that, that that you had up there. Um, I'm great to hear that it's going so well, but let's open up. Do we have any, any questions? Yeah, yes. Um, hi, thank you for a wonderful uh, presentation. Um, I'm an environmental engineer and I could ask tons of <laughs> technical questions, <laughs> but I guess the first thing I thought was you would use the kelp or as food. Uh, is there, because I mean, you mentioned, or someone, uh, Tyler was mentioning, you know, about our problems with agriculture. Mm -hmm. um, is it not uh, ed edible or? So it is, yes. And I wanted to just talk all about kelp, but I was trying to <laughs> <laughs> add in other things. But um, kelp has, yeah, a huge amount of um, basically resources that we can, we can use it for, which makes it uh, so popular in terms of transitioning from this fishing uh, industry forward. Um, and so, yeah, so it's, it's definitely a food product. Um, it's, it's used in, in a lot of companies as a salt substitute. Um, and it's like a, a huge, uh, vitamin asset. So it's used in like, um, pharmaceuticals. You can, people take it and dried, um, with, as like a additive to, to food or smoothies or whatever it might be. Um, cause it contains vitamins that are really difficult for us to get. It, it through other foods mm -hmm. um and yeah people sell it as like just um kelp like chips just more raw 
um, and seaweed salad. So it's absolutely a food component in addition to, you know, some of the plastics and um, other things. And growing it itself is a huge, um, a huge asset as well. It can be grown um, again, downstream of a bunch of the fish farms, because there are, there's obviously a downside of fish farming where there's this nutrient effluent um, that can really pollute um, coastal areas, especially ones that are so clean and um, nutrient rich as Iceland. So if you, if you grow the kelp um, downstream uh, of, of the fish farms, it can clean up a lot of that nutrient effluent because kelp just eats up all of those nitrates. Um, so that's, that's also a huge way of combining all of these different, um, coastal, coastal infrastructures. Uh, it also, my boss was, was looking at a, a region in, um, in the Westfjords out near the, out near, uh, Patrick's Fjord, where there's a lot of coastal erosion going on. Um, and the kelp can be grown, uh, just offshore, um, in the big wall it's grown on like those lines that were in the pictures. Mm -hmm. Um, and it can really prevent a lot of the coastal erosion as well as more of like a physical, mm -hmm. just purely like growing kelp, um, prevents a lot of the coastal erosion. So yeah, it has both human components, um, huge positives for, for fishing, for the fishing industry, um, and can be grown with, with shellfish as well. Uh, and then also, yes, for, for food, of course. And, um, yeah, although, you know, we don't often see it as often in, uh, in sort of Western cuisine, but it's been used for, for centuries in, in Asian yeah. cuisine. And yeah, yeah, for sure. And a very short question. Um, yeah. It is a very narrow growing season or is kelp different from other plants? Um, it's grown typically when it's farmed, it's grown between October and April or May. Um, so it has a, a long growing season, um, but you can harvest a huge amount. So the ocean rainforest in the Faroes is again, sort of the leader for that. So if, if any of you are interested, definitely Google ocean rainforest because um, they have these massive offshore farms that are just on anchors and moorings, but you can have, you know, line after line after line and come up with, with tons of, of, of wet material. Um, and yeah, so definitely. All right. Great. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yes. I promised you an interesting day. I feel that I'm delivering. <laughs> um, so as many of you know, the commission has built up a pretty impressive Arctic program. Um, and we've done that in cooperation with partners uh, in the field. One of our partners is the National Science Foundation in the US. Uh, with whom the commission has really a unique relationship to bring US scholars and fellows to Iceland to conduct research both in the natural and social sciences. So now we're gonna shine the spotlight on our Fulbright NSF Arctic researchers, uh, one now and then we'll continue after lunch. But our first speaker for, for, from this group and our final speaker before the lunch then is Fulbright NSF NSF Arctic Research Fellow, Andrew, uh, who works in environmental sciences, and he's hosted at Reykjavik University, uh, where he's researching sea melt, uh, uh, sea ice meltwater um, productivity in Denmark and the Fram Straits. So Andrew, floor is yours. All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, so my presentation is going to be pretty science heavy, so I'm sorry, um, but I'm going to try to make it accessible. Um, no what I <laughs> so um, what I decided to do with the long Icelandic winter was uh, really dive deep into a ton of data. So um, that's what I'm going to be trying to represent to you all today. And I'm going to be discussing uh, how phytoplankton is impacted by sea ice melt and also by other types of meltwater, such as glacial meltwater off the coast of Iceland and off of Svalbard to the Northwest. So first off, I wanted to talk a little bit about the Fram Strait. Um, the Fram Strait is a region to the Northwest of Iceland. It is North of the Denmark Strait, which is the strait between Greenland and Iceland. And it's a very, very important region in the Arctic Ocean because it is one of the regions of the highest primary productivity within the Arctic. Now, what that means is that you have very large spring phytoplankton blooms that occur within the region. 
And those phytoplankton blooms form the foundation for the entire Arctic ecosystem. So that, well, within that region, but that means they feed uh, the zooplankton, which feed the whales and they feed the fish, which feed the seals and the polar bears. It's really the foundation for the entire ecosystem. Ah, so, um, sorry, let's see, I skipped ahead. There we go, okay. So within the Arctic, there has been uh, an increasing trend of algae blooming, and it seems to be coinciding with rising temperatures around the world. Uh, what we've seen over the past two decades is that, uh, that um, phytoplankton blooming has been increasing by a rate of about uh, 0.3 milligrams per meter cubed per year, which is, you know, units. But what that means, it's kind of a lot. It's impressive that uh, that we've seen so much increasing in blooming. And the Fram Strait is a region where we've really seen a lot. That actually has a pretty significant impact on Icelandic fisheries downstream because this provides the food source for a lot of the Arctic fish, which are then uh, consumed in Iceland. So because uh, we're seeing so much change in this phytoplankton, we thought, okay, let's also look at sea ice because that's one of the things that is changing most dramatically within the Arctic. So over time, we've seen a uh, reduction in sea ice concentration throughout much of the Arctic, but within the Fram Strait, we've actually seen a slight increase or at least a stability of sea ice concentration. And that's a little bit strange. Uh, people might not know exactly what would be causing that, right? Because it's been getting warmer and, uh, and so you would expect ice to be melting more. But what appears to actually be happening is a bit of a bottleneck within the region. So you have simultaneously more sea ice being exported out of the central Arctic because now it's thinner and more broken up. And then at the same time, you have this shifting in wind patterns at the Southern exit from the Fram Strait, which is really holding sea ice in that region and allowing for a lot more melt to happen. So why is that important? What we're seeing is that in the same regions where you have increased freshwater flux and decreasing seawater surface salinity, right? So less salty, fresher water, uh, you're also seeing these phytoplankton blooms occurring. So it seems like there's a connection between sea ice melt water and phytoplankton blooming. So what could be the potential drivers here? Well, there's one big one, which is stratification that people talk about a lot in the literature. And stratification is basically the idea that when you have a lot of fresh water, it will actually float on top of the denser, saltier water. Even though this water is very cold and you know colder things usually sink, it's so much fresher because it's coming from ice that it actually floats on the surface and creates a layer where the theory is this will hold the phytoplankton near the surface and keep them uh, uh, growing as much as possible during this period where we have basically endless sunlight. Right. Now there are other potential uh, causes. One would be seeding. So there's actually algae that grow within ice and uh, they can provide seeding. Some of them can have a partial life cycle inside the ice and then melt out of the ice and then trigger a bit of blooming themselves. Another option would be nutrients. There's actually dust that flows all the way up from the Sahara Desert and deposits on top of sea ice, which contains iron and can potentially uh, uh, act as a nutrient source within the region. Okay, so <laughs> I'm going pretty dense here. So I'm just gonna touch on this slide, but this is basically showing that what we've seen is that as you move away from the ice edge, there's sort of a sweet spot, right? So what you have is a chlorophyll A at the top and you see the maximum chlorophyll A amount happens about 100 uh, to 150 meters from the ice edge. But you also have um, simultaneously this freshwater flux happening. And then you can kind of, you don't have to worry too much about this one. <laughs> and then we, can, we have insulation as well, which is the amount of sunlight that gets through, right? So it appears that there's a, a sort of a sweet spot between sunlight, right? Because you're coming out from under the ice and then freshness. So you have something that the sea ice melt water is contributing to this, uh, to this growth. And this also maps pretty closely 
with models that we uh, did, which uh, basically are uh, mapping insulation and some sort of quantity from CIs. We thought maybe stratification uh, as you move away from the ice edge through, and then the actual data that you see uh, is the red, uh, purple, and orange lines, right? So basically, it follows this sort of insulation versus distance from sea ice uh, uh, and uh, idea, right? So in 2019, <laughs> there was a gigantic phytoplankton bloom in the Fram Strait that maybe could give us a little bit of information about the types of uh, key drivers behind this blooming. Uh, you can see from these uh, postage stamp plots, really, it's just to highlight the fact that 2019 completely washes out everything else. Over there, you can see, I actually broke the um, Y axis there to make it so that it would fit, right? So it's it's so gargantuan that it was, uh, it was really something phenomenal. And uh, I actually happened to be up there on a trip at the time. So uh, I'm incorporating some of the data from that trip as well, some field data along with all this satellite-based data and other remote sensing data. Okay, so you can see it appeared that basically along the ice edge where there was the uh, greatest concentrations of sea ice meltwater, you also had the largest concentrations of phytoplankton pigments. Now I'm gonna put a caveat on this towards the end because these pigments came earlier on in the trip. And later on, there was an interesting thing that happened, which I'll tell you about, <laughs> that kind of changed this relationship a little bit. Um, you also see here uh, where you have, this is a, these are depth profiles, right? So where you have um, high sea ice melt concentrations, which are in the plots that kind of have like a squiggly shape, um, you have high concentrations of phytoplankton pigments. And where we had low, concentrations, you had low concentrations of phytoplankton pigments. So this kind of con uh, confirms in the field what seemed to be the case from satellite data. But things changed after a storm in 2019. Uh, so what happened was uh, uh, there appeared to be some mixing following a storm event, which completely changed the relationship between sea ice melt and phytoplankton blooming within the region. So it seems like what happened after the storm, you kind of have this different fluorescence versus depth relationship. Fluorescence is just a proxy for phytoplankton concentrations, right? And so as you go down the depth profile, we now have more of a, of a depth versus fluorescence relationship. Whereas before the storm, we didn't really see that. And so, uh, what that suggested to us is there were sort of two separate regimes. Before the storm, there was a regime where it really seemed to be maybe stratification driven. But then after the storm, it seemed like everything got mixed up into, uh, into the water column. And that may have sort of broken down that stratification relationship. So now what actually happened is that post storm, we really see um, maybe there's some other quantity other than stratification that is causing this, this, uh, this apparent relationship. So you can see here, I, I crossed that stratification, but with a big asterisk, <laughs> which is, I'm not saying that stratification is not important. That would be like a very big thing to say and very wrong, but it just seemed like there are cases where you can have gigantic blooms, uh, which are very significant and important, um, which uh, uh, don't, necessarily rely on stratification. And so tying that back into why that matters for Iceland, um, into the future, if blooms are sea, are sea ice melt connected, then what we'll see is this temporary amplification of blooms. But then as summer sea ice disappears into the future, which is not that far off, uh, you'll likely see these blooms declining over time, which could mean a lot for Icelandic fisheries, if uh, Arctic fish no longer have a phytoplankton food source uh, near the coast of, of Iceland. But it also points to possible mitigation measures. And this is always tricky territory to get into, right? But if 
the primary contributor from sea ice is something like iron. There have already been successful iron seeding missions in the ocean. It's one of the more interesting sort of geoengineering topics where uh, you'll have ships go out, seed the ocean with some iron, and it only takes a little bit to sort of trigger a bloom because iron's barely limiting. You just need that tiny bit of dust from the Sahara. In this case, maybe you could do some sort of treatment. So if there's a way to generate blooming without sea ice, it also offers a potential solution. But there would need to be a lot more research done. This is just sort of a, it's interesting that we saw such a large bloom without stratification. So thank you very much to Fulbright Iceland, Belinda, Peter, Isa, Reykjavik University, and Lori, my contact there. Um, also, yes, everyone at Brick in Hafnafjordr. <laughs> that is where my, I was there so often, just typing away at a computer. They eventually came over to me. They're like, what are you doing? <laughs> you know. <laughs> and um, they were so nice. Uh, and so I ended up spending a, a lot of time there. Um, I also have to thank everyone from the 29 trip, uh, 2019 trip team. And um, yeah, so I wanted to now take a step into a different direction, some fun stuff in Iceland. <laughs> and um, I, my friend took this, this somewhat epic picture of me in the, the, um, the cave waterfall uh, in, in Southern Iceland here. And I've done a lot of exploring throughout the countryside. That's been a really wonderful experience. So um, here we are at the Black Sand Beach down by the crash plane, right? <laughs> it's a kind of a classic spot. Found this nice little uh, uh, patch of, of growth in this desolate landscape. I thought that was really something quite cool. Um, it's, it's sort of like, it's, it's sort of Iceland-like in a way. <laughs> like This one patch of, of like growth and beauty that just happens to work out right in the middle of almost the Arctic Ocean. Um, and then, uh, yes, I, I saw some amazing waterfalls. Yeah, so cool, <laughs> so cool. And uh, we hiked up and here's me, um, here's me struggling to go up this. Look, I'm kind of top heavy. So when I have to like shuffle up a, up a, a, a crumbly volcanic slope, it's, it was difficult, but uh, my friend didn't make fun of me too much. And uh, yeah, some more nature shots. Sorry. And yeah, so that's all. But thank you all so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, and, uh, just so interesting. Um, Want to ask if, if we have any questions from this side of the audience? Um, or do we have anything on the, if we're waiting, I just said, so um, when, when you leave Iceland, mm -hmm. what, what are your plans? So I've been applying for geospatial data analysis jobs. Um, uh -huh. I'm partially, uh, partway through the hiring process for the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. So I might end up working in government. Uh, yeah, but then uh, I've got a couple other positions I'm looking at as well. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and I plan to kind of continue publishing based off of this research, mm -hmm, so. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so wh wherever you go to work in the US, you see opportunities to sort of, uh, build connections, continue, continue yeah. to build connections with Iceland? Yeah, I didn't get the opportunity to touch on it too much, but I do have uh, a bit of a project, a bit of a field work component I'm planning to do towards the end of May. So unfortunately, the melt season is like right now, right? So, <laughs> yeah. so if I want to do field work uh, with, um, it, within Iceland, I need to kind of do it in, in a couple weeks. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, there's a contact I have at um, actually, uh, University Center Westfjords, mm -hmm. and um, also, uh, so Isabella Price and her advisor, and we'll likely be doing some uh, analysis more glacially related up in that region. And then um, I do have some other uh, contacts within Hospital Eastlands. And so really, uh, Lori at Reykjavik University did a great, was really helpful in just kind of connecting me to all the different people I, I needed because there's just different machinery and stuff that is useful for this. And I kind of have to go all over Iceland to pick out exactly what I need, right? Like not everywhere has a yeah. gas chromatograph or <laughs> I, ratio, or like isotope ratio mass spec or something. All right. Bye.
And we are exactly on time, I think, which is pretty impressive. Um, so um, I want to give everybody, though, before we break for lunch, just everybody who presented this morning, let's give them another round of applause. guys gave us a really great start to our day and so thank you so much we're going to take a, a lunch break now we will start again promptly at one so if you're joining us virtually uh and you don't want to miss anything be back at one and for our, those who are here uh we have a lunch planned out in the restaurant here um and we we hope to see you all there